Yeah, we would like to first uh, thank Sonic Axe for inviting us and to OTA 300 AIN for hosting. <laughs> I was like practicing my Dutch like all week to get that right. <laughs> Uh, tonight we'll share insights into the ongoing artistic research, our field trip to Mitri Island, and basically our open reflections on the whole process. Out of Focus is an audiovisual experience exploring climate change, mineral extraction, post-colonialism in northern Greenland through material lenses and indigenous storytelling. The presentation will take you down the Crimson Cliffs, past the Fjord of the Dead, and over the Signal Mountain. A harpoon of light cuts through the heavens. The night, night sky turns to fire. A sound of a thousand whales. Arne Kitsuk, woman, dog, havoc one, Ture, havoc two, and Akbar Erik smush into the sleepy landscape of Imna Minuman. As they hit the ice, their memories melt away. The walking stones forget where they come from, willing to offer the spirits to a new ground. I touch the walking stones when they sleep. Their cold, shiny bodies breathe and pulse. These masses of metal appear to be very heavy. By their journey, they speak of the stars, the sky, the fire, by their color, dark night, and by their density, the cohesion of terrestrial things. Their liveliness excites me to morph them further. I sculpt urus, knives, and harpoon hats. In Salambo, a novel from 1862, Gustave Flaubert poetically portrays, quote, the abaders, stones which had fallen from the moon, whirling in slings of silver thread, unquote. Meteorites have inspired generations of artists, poets, and filmmakers to dream about other worlds and reflect on, on human positioning within the universe. Around 10,000 years ago, a meteor shower hit the grounds of the present-day Cape York Peninsula in northern Greenland. The fragments of walking stones spread across the crimson cliffs, past the Fjord of the Dead, and over the Signal Mountain. In Out of Focus, we explore the unique ability of these iron meteorites to lock in magnetic information. So, as a meteoroid burns through the Earth's atmosphere, it heats up above its Curie temperature. This 570 degrees Celsius hot spell rewrites the stone's magnetic data to match the earthly parameters, and simultaneously erasing the information about its cosmic origin. So these special powers of storing, erasing, and overwriting data gave iron meteorites the nicknames of hard drives from space. And this geological anomaly of falling stars sparked a technological advancement in the Arctic. The people of northern Greenland called Inuruit mined valuable ores from the extraterrestrial material. Using basalt stones as hammers, they would chip off meteorite fragments to model their devices. With every clang, bang, and dong, they would unknowingly cause a stress magnetism effect, changing the properties of the material. Alongside this technological application, the cultural significance of meteorites flourished in myths and drum songs. The Inuruit gave names to the walking stones who became protagonists of their stories. Inspired by the idea of breathing spirits into the meteorites, Arna Kitsuk, woman, dog, Havik one, Ture, Havik two, and Akparuruk reappear as non-human characters in Out of Focus. Through a series of art scientific experiments in the Arctic and at the Paleomagnetic Laboratory in Utrecht, Samples of Cape York meteorites are demagnetized and then magnetized to measure. In the process of rewriting their magnetic history, new stories will emerge. In the past, the Havahimuk, people of the Great Irons, decapitated woman meteorite and sledged its head away. This act maddened the weather demon, Tupalak, who pierced a crack straight through the ice sheet, swallowing the heavenly stone. The thieves narrowly escaped their lives, but learned that nature guards its own deposits. 
Today, geologists drill out, cut off, and measure up the mineral samples. As a result of climate change, mineral deposits previously hidden under the ice cap are completely revealed. The prospects of acquiring new land with, quote, the most interesting assets and vast deposit potentials, unquote, inspire mining startups to dig and explore. Prices of minerals shrink and expand like the Arctic ice. The licenses for digging become investments for global players who actually bet in favor of the ecological catastrophe. In this landscape of pure speculation, an uncertain climate may liquefy straight into clash flow. The melting of the ice only encourages the extractive mechanism present in the landscape for centuries. Parallel to Danish colonization, the 19th century North Pole expeditions, in, like those led by American Robert Perry, set out to find and retrieve these mineral trophies. In this process, the Greenlandic meteorites found their ways into the museums of New York and Copenhagen. This relocation of heaven stones aligned with the displacement of the Inuit people who guided their cherished resources to the western shorelines. Parallel to the extraction of Anikitsok meteorite, Perry took a group of Greenlanders to New York. The indigenous people were disgracefully displayed as a living anthropological zoo at the Museum of Natural History. A century later, after a series of evictions instigated by these colonial powers, forced migration is now prompted by new mining ventures. Dredges, bulldozers, earth augers, oil drums, diesel generators slowly creep into settlements and nomadic hunting grounds. And yet the traditional Inuit way of life is not only threatened by mining, during a cafe mix section with, uh, on Mitri Island, which is where we were doing most of the field research, we spoke to the elder, who is kind of like a shaman in disguise, uh, Karnak Nielsen, uh, who shared his thoughts about these dangers of the erratic climate. Quote, these animals, polar bears and narwhals, come and go. They are living with the weather. One winter they are here, and the next winter they are not here. The weather is very unstable. Hunting nowadays is hard and tiring, especially for those who rely on it." Unquote. The locals don't only depend on wildlife as a source of food, but also consider hunting rituals as the beating heart of their identity. Climate instability disrupts this traditional way of life for the Inuit by leaving them to a tragic choice between the life-threatening danger of hunting on the thin ice sheet or the huge distress of employment in the post-colonial power structure. For the Greenlandic society, the live geology of that island can either become a garden or a grave. The auctioning of mineral licenses contributes to a level of political and economic independence from Denmark. In this view, Greenland's natural resources shifts from common good to commodity. But by doing so, the garden of metals would become liberated from post-colonial power, but then sliced open by foreign mineral extraction. So you have all these international companies who then jump in and buy up land. So these dilemmas are haunting the landscape still today. Anirnik breath. Anirnit, many breaths, Hila, a breath of life. The spirit of every living being is borrowed from the sky and the air around them. I am a seal. I inhale the frosty ghosts to guard me underwater. I seek out a beautiful harpoon head in order to exhale my life without pain. If the design follows the rule of ritual and custom, my spirit will reside in the harpoon head for one night after my death. The indigenous cosmology animates the landscape as a breathing system. According to the Inuruit, the breaths, meaning spirits, of all living beings are borrowed from Hila, which stands for the weather, climate, consciousness, and mind. In the moment of death, bodies return their breaths back to the landscape. And this exchange of spirit portrays nature as a network of interconnected parts. In Northern Greenland, the cycles of life and death are experienced daily 
at the edge of the sea ice, at the breathing holes, on dock sledges and in kayaks. Traditionally and still to this day, the Inuruit use iron harpoons for hunting. According to a myth recorded in 1929 by the Greenlandic Danish anthropologist Knut Rasmussen, quote, the soul of a seal resides in a harpoon head for one night after the seal has been killed, unquote. For the Inuruit, this hunting tool is not a weapon, but a, but a device to facilitate the passage of breaths from one body to another. The contemporary Norwegian ethnographer Hans Christian Gulluf describes a harpoon to be, quote, a medium of continuity between living beings, unquote. Making harpoon heads out of extraterrestrial metal, the Inuruit envisioned the capacity of iron meteorites to lock in magnetic data like hard drives from space. Inspired by the Inuruit relationship of the, with the landscape, ruled by weather demons, staggering rocks, and exchanges of breaths, our project Out of Focus proposes a new reading of the Greenlandic tormented tundra. The indigenous idea of Gila, connecting all living beings, finds its contemporary expression in spectral data woven out of geomagnetic waves. Our custom-made microphones, called geotools, detect magnetic anomalies caused by climate change and mineral displacement. The data output, amplified by shifting weather, is converted into sonic representations. By immersing in these sounds, we would like to challenge the colonial extractive relationship with the Arctic landscape. Additionally, the fragments of walking stones, shipped out of the country by colonizers and explorers, return to Greenland. This restitution of material prof mineral trophies is followed by the procedure of inserting a new magnetic moment into a meteorite sample. Organized in collaboration with the Havichivik community, all hunters, elders, artisans, shamans and children are involved in this ritual. With a simple blowtorch, a meteorite fragment is heated up above its curie temperature. This hot spell erases the stone's magnetic history. On an alchemical level, the colonial weight is lifted, triggering a new opening. So these are photos from the um, happening we, we, we did in Greenland last summer. Um, yeah, the magnetizing meteorite sample and then magnetizing it again. Um, so it gains the, the same magnetic uh, setup as the, the area where it uh, was magnetized last summer. We believe that immersive methods of storytelling evoke a deeper emotional response compared to scientific visualizations of pie charts and data percentages. In Geomorphic Video 2017, art theorist Ursula Byman calls for the urgency of an embodied interpretation of scientific data. She says, quote, it is fairly easy to access vast amounts of scientific data about the climate and the environment but the explanation of data cannot alone help us understand the magnitude of change that lies ahead of us. Aesthetics that are capable of reaching the imaginary will be necessary, and these often call a fictional status." Unquote. Encouraged by the words of Byman, the audiovisual project Out of Focus creates material imaginaries that step beyond the static world of scientific communication. Our custom instruments convey the landscape's expression beyond the binaries of zero and one. Through these combined lenses of art and science, the viewer can immerse in the spectral polyphony of disrupted ecology. Ice carving thunders, narwhal electro clicking, frantic beluga sopranos, nomadic radio chatter, helicopter blade clapping, and hunting boat rumbles tune the listeners further into the accelerated geography. Cinematic and artistic methods present in our project align with Bruno Latour's criticism of anthropogenic aesthetics. In The Verifiable Image of the World, 2019, Latour writes, quote, we are so accustomed to seeing our blue planet from the outside in, as if we were imprisoned in a raucous space station or sitting on a throne of God, that we have completely forgotten to what extent this astronomical image of the world poorly reflects the common habitat shared by the living, unquote. 
looking at the earth from above creates the illusion of separation in which the viewer seemingly does not participate in the object of viewing, that is, shifting landscape. This way of seeing certainly remains a deception as humans are part of nature and earth is their habitat. Surprisingly, even when artistically addressing the issues of the Anthropocene, many methods and tools are identical to those used in landscape extraction, such as drone filming, satellite mapping, and remote sensing. In this way, the images of ecological disasters fall into the category of horrifying but sublime aesthetics. Examples range from the epic drone shots to ice, of ice calving to the captures of fluorescent toxic tailings. Admitting Latour's criticism of probing the earth outside in, our strategy is to trace the evidence of shifting landscape from inside out. Through listening to the sounds of fluctuating geomagnetic fields, the crew is guided across the terrain. In this way, the sonic maps conduct the dramaturgy of navigating in space, composing the audiovisual narrative. This approach invites the landscape to speak, scream and stutter. Applying this perspective of object-oriented ontology by looking through the material lenses of the landscape, the project constructs a narrative that shifts away from the colonial framing. Besides physical conquests, the Danish and American colonizers constructed their own hierarchical interpretations of the Greenlandic landscape and culture. To bypass these biased perspectives, the fragments of Cape York meteorite become important non-human storytellers and story triggers throughout the project. Uh, yeah, so in Out of Focus, the project not only objects speak. The Arctic materialities are always explored in relation to its human inhabitants. The project becomes a platform that gives voice to the Inuit people who are directly bound with the landscape. Our communication with the local community was made possible by the Kanak hunter and rock and roll musician Alakatsiak Perry, who, while we were in the location, we actually found out was not only with us following the traces of these meteorites, but it turns out that his great-great-grandfather was actually Robert Perry the person who took the meteorites to the New York in the first place. Over the last seven months, the stories that we have been working with of the people of the Great Irons have been translated from Inukton to English by uh, a girl who lives in one of the nearby villages, Miyuki Deo Nara. Her background, uh, growing up in this village but now studying anthropogenic anthropology, contributes to building a narrative which is climate aware for the Inu from the Inuit position. Additionally, the efforts to transcribe and translate spoken accounts contribute to the preservation of this minority language, a vanishing language spoken by less than 900 people. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to play yeah, a really short five-minute raw audio composition, which is like a big amalgamation of things that we recorded over a month when we were there. And we'll, it will go dark, and then we're going to enter the Q&A about it. So yeah, thank you so much for listening.
Thank you both so much uh, for sharing this project with us. Uh, maybe we can actually reflect on the sounds that we heard for a second, because of course some of them were recognizable, but others were a bit more abstract. Can you talk a little bit about, I know there was quite an amalgamation of a lot of recordings. Maybe you can say a little bit about what we were hearing. Um, yeah, so to begin with, we thought it was important to have this idea of like full spectrum recording. So the idea that we record everything through the whole process in a kind of full transitory way. And so you hear, most of the time, a lot of people who go to Greenland, they say there's this scariness of silence. that mm. You will never get used to the silence there. And that is true, but also the, the impact of sound is so strong, in a sense, because there is that, that absence of it. So most of the time you're hearing the rumbling of a diesel generator on the back of a boat or you're hearing a, a splash of a seal. And so these sounds also become really important for the people there because they're, they're like markers also, mm. the territory. So what you hear is uh, hydrophones, you hear what we hear when we're there, our own experiences, and then you hear the, the geomagnetic sounds. So that's the sound of the landscape itself. Mm -hmm. That's this kind of the screams, the stutters, the speaking. Uh, and that's done through this microphone that we built ourselves, um, that we kind of hacked <laughs> away at, and uh, that gives that kind of weird, scary sound that some people have from it. <laughs> and the, oh, go ahead. So sometimes the geo tool picks up um, radio waves from uh, nearby American airbase uh, and some radio chatter, and sometimes it picks up really the the sounds or the, the waves that are emitted by metals that are stored in the ground. So um, the amalgamation is human-made and uh, geo-made. But uh, yeah, um, the, the lack of the man-made structure actually amplifies the, uh, the geo sounds. So that's why we also thought it's interesting to, yeah, to focus on that. And with these devices that you built, which we saw a picture of uh, during your presentation, were they also devices that people could listen through as well, or were they just functioning as a recording device? No, yeah. So we had like mini concerts in uh, like in the meteorite craters themselves. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, even though they live quite close to these sites, they'd never visited them before, because stories there they're only passed uh, through oral transmission. So these, this part of history, even though it was only 100 years ago, it's still been lost to the people who live there now. So when we kind of turned up and we were kind of returning this piece, it was also really interesting for them to hear these stories. So then we thought, okay, let's go to the creators all together as this whole community and have a mini concert of all this kind of spectrum of sounds. So they were kind of also an audience yeah. there going on. Great, thank you. I was thinking about like the ideas around time that are embedded in this project, of course, like how we, I mean, the meteor in itself also always gives us like a very specific understanding of time, um, but also that you were there for, I think, over a month, um, but you were only filming for three days, so it also created like a, I think, maybe for you, maybe I'm just, I'm just, th but for me, it would create like a very kind of uh, interesting understanding of, uh, of also time and how you worked on this project. I'm just wondering if it like maybe altered some uh, of your own understandings. Yeah, time, time was a really f interesting aspect to this period. We also had the luxury of time because we had managed to secure ourselves a month mm. to disappear. <laughs> and that was really interesting because like when we first also arrived on the island, there is no really concept also of uh, you're going to be here on this day. There's no like calendar. There's no like time frame. There's no clock on the wall, this kind of thing. So we immediately were slowed down. Also, it's 24 seven daylight. That's a big mm -hmm. impact also on your body clock. Um, and so even entering a conversation, like if we have a conversation here tonight, it's maybe for what, 20 minutes <laughs> or 15 minutes. <laughs> But when we were there, we'd talk to one person for a whole day. Mm -hmm. And it wouldn't just be like, let's sit down and have an interview. But like you said, it's like we had, to, we had to slow ourselves down to kind of understand how to kind of have a conversation also, which was also really fascinating on the self-reflective idea of what is a conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and then also the idea of just being on a boat for three days. We also messed up a little bit because we went in the very late part of the season. We went when the weather started to go uh, really bad. So 
what normally would be like a, I don't know, a one day trip to the island turns out to be like a three or four day boat ride. And so this like constant uh, reflection on time was really, really present. Also geological time, because things happen really, really quickly. I mean, they call it live geology. Mm. So you never know when something is going to change. And uh, there was this term, I remember, that at first made me a little bit angry, this term, which was imaka, which means maybe. And when you talk to people they, and you say, oh, maybe we go out today, they say, imaka, imaka, like maybe, maybe. So you also never know when to do things because time is always in the state of imaka. It's always in the state of maybe. <laughs> Also for us, it was very exciting to take the great, great, great grandson uh, to the meteorite sites where his uh, great, great, great grandfather <laughs> extracted these meteorites from. Uh, so, I mean, at least for me, it would have been very exciting to, to do that. Um, but uh, we had the situation that when, on the first day when we went, uh, at some point he, he said, oh, you don't need me anymore, do you mind if I just go out now and uh, to, to the bay and hunt some seals? Uh, because I know you're vegetarian, so, <laughs> so this was also, um, yeah, for him that was important and not some maybe symbolic involvement in certain ritual, mm. um, which later on became interesting for him. But uh, in that moment, there was a seal, so it meant I have to seize the, the timing and really go yeah, hunt it. So uh. <laughs> uh, We have time for one more question, if there's a question from the audience, or I have my final question. <laughs> okay. Um, so I was, uh, yeah, I mean, I know you're going back uh, quite in the summer or quite soon. I was just wondering, like, what the next uh, steps are, the next, uh, yeah, what you're going to actually do when you go back um, and maybe some next sort of iterations or steps in the project. Um, yeah, it's still an unknown. We only found out, like, I don't know, a week ago yeah, <laughs> that we would go back. <laughs> um, but we also realized like the kind of essentialness of this idea of like a long-term relationship with that community and with that island itself, like that landscape itself. So I think when we go back, we will also um, slow down even more, <laughs> uh, spend more time, but also the fact that now we're kind of bearing a little bit more about the language itself, I think that will help to kind of facilitate uh, more, I more ideas and also the fact that a lot of our conversations were happening indoors because it was really, really bad weather mm -hmm. sometimes. So we were also thinking a lot more now about how can conversations happen uh, in an environment. So what is the difference between having a conversation in a kind of safe, secure hut mm -hmm. compared to having a conversation on a boat where you're kind of being bounced around and there's this kind of, the medium of the landscape is actually performing in the conversation itself. Um, so I think that's something we're talking a little bit about, but it's still early. <laughs> we're also thinking about um, involving the, the community as uh, co-authors of the project, so to maybe involve them in some um, uh, community script writing and uh, maybe they will take part in our film. Uh, yeah, maybe they will play roles that they want to play um, instead of uh, reenacting something that uh, was maybe in our heads. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, we want to work on methodology or framework to make that happen, yeah. Great, thank you. Very curious how, uh, how it's all gonna go. Um, thank you both so much. Thank you.